It's time for us to talk about something really serious. We need to talk about the gaps in my armour. Hi folks, Matt Eason here of Scholar Gladiatory. Now, you will have seen that my previous video to this one was a video revealing my new armour and I had loads of great comments and feedback and questions under there as well, some of which I've addressed and answered. Hopefully that was useful and hopefully you enjoyed seeing my new armour revealed. And as you know, and if you've watched that video you'll know, um, it is a process of continual tweaking and adjustments and possibly optional parts, changing parts, uh, and this kind of stuff. So that is true of all armour. It's very rare, it doesn't matter how good the armour is and what level you kind of, you pay to, uh, there will always be some things you want to change about your armour. Not necessarily always because it's uh, not all working great, that can often be the case, but sometimes it's just because it's not working great for what you want it to do. And that's really the main context of this video. So, whenever I do videos about armour, people often point out the gaps. They go, oh, but, but Matt, I would just uh, stab you in the armpit or I'd stab you in the uh, inside of the elbow or uh, in the back of your gauntlet or in the back of your legs. Why aren't the back of your legs covered? So there's a few things to deal with here. Now, first of all, I'm going to say that most armour throughout history, in fact, the, the vast majority of armour throughout history doesn't, cannot and did not protect all parts of your body. Most armour is a question of prioritising what you have to protect the most and sometimes you can't protect certain bits for certain reasons, we'll look at in a second, and sometimes you have to have different levels of protection for different parts of your body. Now, the next thing to say is that in this period, in the 15th century, what you're seeing with me in my full harness there is very close to the top level of most armoured people on a late medieval battlefield, okay? So it's, it's a knight, if we want to call them that. Although that's a social and legal rank rather than necessarily describing what armour you're wearing. So this type of man-at-arms wearing this knightly type of armour is pretty much the apex predator on the medieval battlefield. Now, the first thing to realise is the vast majority of people on a medieval battlefield are people like pikemen, billmen, crossbowmen, longbowmen, gunners, these types of, types of people, and very, very few of them wear complete harness of this all-encompassing nature. So while my armour does have certain gaps, we'll talk about those gaps in a second, while it does have certain gaps, it has far fewer gaps than all of the other people who aren't also knights or men-at-arms on the med medieval battlefield. Archers and billmen and all of these sort of crossbowmen, all of these sorts of people have far less armour. So in relative terms, you're still extremely heavily armoured. And of course, to briefly mention at this point, if we compare to other periods of history, if we look at a Roman soldier, for example, even the heaviest legions in the Dacian campaigns, um, they they were, even if they were wearing like a, a, a sort of manifer on one arm, um, uh, so they had an armoured arm, which most Roman legionaries didn't have, of course. Um, if we look at their lorica, so whether they're wearing lorica hamata, if we call it that, so male shirts, or whether they're wearing lorica segmentata, if we call it that, which I understand might not be the correct term for it, um, which is a form of plate armour, or you know, the scale armor, various other armors that the Romans wore, for the most part, that really only covers the torso. Not all of them even have those large shoulder guards that is so popular in Hollywood. So they've got exposed, and they have a helmet, of course, and they sometimes have greaves, and they sometimes have something on their arm, but large parts of their body are uncovered, okay? Usually their arms, usually most of their legs, you could even say their groin to some extent, usually the face, pretty much always the face actually, except for the cheek plates. So they've got huge great openings. So if we come back to the medieval, and if we, indeed, I said other periods, if we look at the modern era, if we look at, uh, someone made a very good comment on my Facebook page actually today, um, where they pointed out, you know, modern armour, people don't point out when looking at a modern soldier with the plate carrier that there are gaps, and clearly the face is usually uncovered and usually the limbs. So yes, they're wearing armour, yes, they're wearing a helmet, yes, they're wearing a plate carrier, or with a Roman soldier, they're wearing a helmet, and some form of torso defence, but large parts of the rest of their body are uncovered. And this was true in the medieval period as well, which is the period really, in most of the world, we could look at some parts of perhaps Chinese and also Korean history and things like this, where some soldiers did wear a lot of armour, but certainly in Western history, 
the medieval, the late medieval <coughs> period is the period of the heaviest level of armour that we really see. If we go forward in times of the 16th and then the 17th century, we see lighter armour, we see more exposure. So by the middle of the, six, uh, middle of the 1500s, so the middle of the 16th century, we see a lot of soldiers wearing a breastplate with a backplate and tassets and a helmet, but usually their face is uncovered, their limbs are uncovered, so a huge great opening. So back into the late medieval period, so we're talking, let's say, 14th, 15th century here. Indeed, even a heavily armoured knight has some openings, but nothing like as many openings as a typical medieval soldier has. Now let's consider the specific openings on my armour. So a number of people pointed out the inside of my elbows, which were lacking mail. Now the first thing to say is, this is actually not unhistorical and it's not actually that unusual. If we look at medieval art, we actually see lots of examples of people not having mail on their inner elbows. That being said, I do intend to put mail on my inner elbows. It's only missing at the moment because I haven't stitched it onto my doublet yet. But you will notice that I do have mail in my armpits. I have mail around my groin. Um, and you know, potentially at some point I might even get those male underpants um, to, to wear underneath as well. So you actually have two layers of, of mail down at the groin. Now, in terms of the other areas, so the other areas which are not covered by mail or plate. So a number of people mentioned the opening on my right pauldron. So this is for a very specific purpose. It's for couching a lance. Now, what I'm wearing is an Italian export armour, which is primarily aimed at people who are going to, at least some of the time, sit on a horse and stick a lance under their armpit. You cannot do that if you have a pauldron like I have on my left, if you also have it on the right. Um, so if you're intending to use a lance, doesn't matter whether it's a big lance or a light lance, if you're intending to couch anything under your armpit, you can't have a great big pauldron there. Um, so you can only have mail. Um, so the quality of your mail is quite important and in period there was some mail which was proofed to a higher level than other mail and you could get steel mail, you could even get heat treated mail. But anyway, the fact is you can only have mail there because you need that flexibility for a lance. Now if you were fighting on foot, indeed we do see armours for fighting on foot where you have symmetrical pauldrons. This was actually quite popular in England at this time. And it's something that I will probably look at, in fact, and I will probably get alternative spaulders and or pauldrons for this armour, which are symmetrical. So don't worry, folks, you will see that. The other option, of course, is besagues, and a number of people mention besagues. They are hanging down uh, discs, or they can sometimes be rectangular or oblong, in front of the armpit. The first thing to say about those is while they do give extra protection, they are also movable because you still need to be able to couch the lance under your arms. So they need to be able to move up and down. So they don't offer as much protection as a large pauldron does, but they offer more versatility. We'll come back to the subject of versatility in a minute. So yes, besagues are also an option. So there are other options, but this is just a very typical Italian setup for armour with a big gap. And in fact, English armour often had the same. In fact, it had a big hole for the, uh, for the lance to go under, uh, under the right arm. Now, the next thing that people mentioned was the back of my legs. And yes, number one, it's true. I'm not wearing mail on the back of my legs. However, a vast number of original uh, um, artwork sources show people with no mail on the back of their legs. Why is this? Well, firstly, it's quite difficult to wear it there. It adds a lot of weight. It's quite difficult to suspend it. What do you suspend it from? You're already suspending the leg harness from the doublet. If you now add male legs to it as well, it adds a lot more weight. Okay. Now, the English got around this by having fully encased upper cuisses. I won't just say the English. Sometimes the Italians, sometimes the French did this, and very occasionally uh, other people like the, the Germans as well, and the Spanish did this. So fully enclosed upper legs, like you have on the lower legs, were a thing that they did sometimes. But this adds weight, and also importantly, it interferes with your ability to ride a horse. So the knight is first and foremost a mounted warrior. He is heavy cavalry, cuirassier. And therefore, when you're sitting on a horse, well, the back of your legs are covered up because you're sitting on a horse. Uh, the, the, the inside that is against the horse. But also, you get an advantage from having that almost flesh on flesh contact. Okay, in reality, it's clothing on leather, but you have that contact, that sort of sensitivity to the saddle and the horse, and that makes you better at horsemanship. Now, not to say you can't wear fully enclosed upper legs, cuisse, with a saddle. You can, and it is shown in art, and clearly people like the English and the French did do it, and sometimes the Italians. 
but you add weight to the armor and you lose some of that sensitivity for riding by doing so. So it's all a compromise. It's all about versatility and what your priorities are. Okay, the other areas which are open uh, or gaps, which a lot of people didn't seem to mention was the face, okay? Now, even with the Great Bassinet, okay, the Great Bassinet is one of the most protective helmets you can get, probably surpassed only by a frog mouth, but you know the compromises involved in wearing a frog mouth. Extremely limited vision, terrible for fighting on foot. Augusto will hate me for saying that because he likes examples of people fighting on foot in them, but let's be honest, you can't look down. If you drop your weapon, you've got no idea where it is. Um, and they, they, are, they are bolted to the breast and back plate, so you, you're quite limited in movement as well. And if someone grabs one, they can yank you all around and manipulate you by it. So there are disadvantages to frog mouths and to great bassinets. But even with a frog mouth or a great bassinet, it has an opening to see and breathe out of. So even if you're fighting someone in a great bassinet, you can still stab a rondel dagger into a visor slit if it has a slit. It's the same thing with a, um, with a, with a salad. You can still stab in here. Um, equally, if I was wearing a bever here, you can still pull the salad up, and this is shown in art lots, and stab between the bever and the salad. Obviously, if you're wearing an open face helmet, you have an even more exposed face. And a lot of people wearing salads did not wear bevers, either because they were uncomfortable or they didn't see the use or they thought, well, I'll just risk it. So. The fact is, even helmets which look really protective, or even ones which are less protective, you have access to the face somehow, whether it's to an open face or through a slit. The next one which people often forget about is gauntlets. If you want to be able to hold objects and fight, you will have openings in your gauntlets, and this is shown in the treatises how to exploit this. Clearly, the inside of the gauntlet has usually at most leather. Some gauntlets don't even have leather on there. They actually show bare hands inside. But also you have the cuff. You can get in the back of the cuff. Um, so there's openings to the gauntlets. So there's always these ones that people have pointed out. Armpits, faces, back of legs. Yes, those are potential openings, but they're equally shown in medieval art. And there are other openings as well. And it doesn't matter how much armor you put on, there are always going to be some openings. You can only reduce the number of openings. So finally, we'll come to versatility and compromises. Okay, And that's really what this is all about. So I refer you to my first point, and that is that the medieval knight, even if they've got some gaps and openings in their armor, and remember that even very high nobility and kings sometimes chose to wear an open face helmet for the advantages that offers in seeing and breathing and communicating despite the risks, even though um, you might be able to cover a lot of your body, there are always going to be some gaps. Now, you might say there are some exceptions to this. What about Henry VIII's foot combat armour, which was actually not finished and not used, but used for the field of the cloth of gold? And in fact, he used the, the tonneliton armour instead. That is an example of an armor with minimum openings. It has a visor, which is designed that you can't really get a point through because it's just got little holes. It has um, articulations on the insides of the elbows and the butt and the backs of the knees. It has maximum coverage, but at what cost? This is a tournament armor. Okay, that is a very, very specialized tournament armor made for one of the most powerful monarchs in that era in Europe. Okay, so it's a very expensive armor. It limits mobility a lot. You couldn't probably ride a horse in it, at least not very well. Um, you probably couldn't command troops in it. There's probably a lot of things you couldn't do very easily, actually, at all in it. It is a specific armor for a specific purpose. It is not a good war armor. You couldn't joust in it. You couldn't couch a lance in it, I wouldn't think. Not, not very well, anyway. So the fact is it's hugely limiting, and that's what it all comes down to. That's why late medieval soldiers of the common types, the ones that made up 90% of the people on the medieval battlefield, your longbowmen, your crossbowmen, your billmen, your pikemen, your spearmen, your, you know, your gunners, these people, the typical infantry, didn't wear this level of all-encompassing armour because it would have been too hot, too fatiguing, too tiring, and it, they wouldn't have been able to operate their bows, their crossbows, or, or their various weapons, or climb up siege ladders, or dig trenches, and all of these things they needed to do in full plate harness, which a knight doesn't need to do. A knight can be dressed by other people, as you saw with Zach dressing me, 
uh, he can be dressed and undressed by people, he can be fed and watered by people, he can even have people to help him go to the toilet. Typical soldiers can't do this. So, to conclude, all medieval armour and all armour from all periods has gaps. Please, and I know I've made this plea before, but I'll continue doing so, please stop pointing out the gaps on late medieval or renaissance armour when these gaps are really, really minimal. I mean, the back of the legs, when someone is fighting you and trying to hit you, the back of the legs are really difficult to get at. By all means, try and get round there, try and get round to my butt and stab me in the butt <laughs> while I'm repeatedly whacking you in the head with a pole axe, okay? Or shanking you with a rondel dagger. You, you, you know, you knock yourself up. That is, that is your job. That's what, that's how you take out the fully armoured opponent, yes. But it ain't easy, okay? Because they're gonna be trying to kill you and they have, unless you're equally armoured, in which case stop complaining about the gaps, um, you have a lot more gaps than they do. Okay, right, so there we go. Armour's all about compromises. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about World War II tanks or whether you're talking about modern law enforcement or military or whether you're talking about the late medieval knight. You cannot perfectly encase a medieval knight in a metal sphere and have no gaps. They wouldn't be able to function. They'd be able to roll around, but they wouldn't be able to function. <laughs> okay, if you want to be able to function as a soldier on horseback or on foot, you need armor that enables you to manipulate weapons, move around, walk, take your own weight, and talk to people and breathe and see. Um, anyway, I hope that's useful. I hope this has been thought provoking. If you have any specific questions about my armor or armors of this period, then get posting down below because I'd love to make more videos on this topic. It's a rich gold mine of, of, of topics, I think, to talk about, uh, particularly on this channel. Uh, maybe I could bring in friends like, uh, like Zach and other people in on it. Uh, but anyway, I hope to see you down in the comments. Thanks a lot for watching. And if you haven't seen the previous video, make sure you go and check it out. And I'll see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.